talk to me about something and write something else <laughs> but anyway it's a good very pleasing yeah, news but, <laughs> but 100 faculty members i mean you know where am i going to get money from uh, sir yeah. sorry to disturb you uh, interrupt you our live telecast have started on the facebook okay. so right. we should start now okay it is just three would you like to wait over to professor uh, suman berryman okay good afternoon everyone it's my pleasure and pleasant duty to welcome you all on behalf of sbi society for promotion of science and technology in india and chandigarh chapter of nasi नहीं वो आपने वो कर दिया कनेक्ट उसमें एंटर करके रखो हेलो वेरी स्पेशल लेक्चर बाय प्रोफेसर पुष्पिंदर सियाल she would be talking on the topic which for which the nobel prize in literature was given for this year 2020 in october and we welcome you professor pushpender welcome you and uh, thank you for joining us here today and i would like to thank all the participants who have joined us to listen to this special lecture thank you very much everyone professor grover dharamveer ji uh, welcome to you in your own society's lecture here and uh, i would hand over to professor arun grover our vice president of spsci and former vice chancellor to give the opening remarks professor grover hello everybody so i am very happy to have been accorded the privilege of saying few sentences before we invite professor pushpinder sian to speak on nobel prize 2020 so i this at the suggestion of president spsti this idea got precipitated that while we are hosting lectures on nobel prizes on the subjects of science we must attempt to host a lecture also on the nobel prize in literature as far as india is concerned the first nobel prize that came to india was indeed in literature and we are all very proud of rabindranath tagore having been awarded the nobel prize in literature so it felt odd that we were leaving out the nobel prize in literature while hosting these expository lectures for the young students of india so it's very nice that we have commenced the process of hosting this nobel prize in literature as well while we are hosting the lectures on nobel prizes and other subjects so dharamveer ji asked me whom should you invite so obviously we should invite somebody from the university and uh, my personal choice was uh, requesting professor pushpinder sial to deliver this lecture i didn't know her before i joined as a vice chancellor but few months after my joining when we invited professor romela thapar to give the first pu foundation day lecture and we announced the commemoration of 150 years of higher education in punjab and also commemorate the 150th birthday of ruchi ram sani it is in those few months that i came in contact with professor pushpinder sial and uh, i have been very impressed with her scholarship so 2012 2013 we moved on and uh, professor pratibha rajpal <coughs> and professor pushpinder sial they were in the forefront of organizing those uh, commemoration of uh, 150th birth year of ruchi ram sani in april of 2013 moved on to 2014 and we thought of organizing and commemorating the birth centenary year of kushwant singh ji unfortunately kushwant singh ji passed away in march of 2014 when he had just entered his 
hundredth year, and so we invited his son, uh, Mr. Rahul Singh, uh, to commemorate the centenary year of uh, Kushwan Singh. And the year next, uh, CPU organizes this con annual convocation, and typically the governors or vice president or the president is called to those convocations. And many a times these. Uh, the protocol officers of these high dignitaries, they seek information on the university or they ask for a draft speech of the VIP chief guest and so on. And I <laughs> reached out to Pushwinderji to write about the university, to give, make a draft speech for the president and so on and so forth. And she has a very lucid and style of writing, very impressive. And uh, I will just read out to you uh, just two paragraphs she wrote about the university, which was sent to President Pappana Mukherjee in February of 2015. So she wrote about the university. In its genesis, Punjab University is singularly founded in the traditions of learning stemming from the hoary past of the land of the five rivers and the ancient civilizations that form the very foundation of this land. As Sri Govind Vallabh Pant said in his convocation address of 1957, the Punjab has been the cradle of the most ancient civilization known to the recorded history. Here, near this place, the first hymns of the Rig Veda were chanted and the words of Upshanadik wisdom were uttered. Down the centuries, it has been the meeting place for different civilizations and cultures and from their co-mingling has been born the rich synthesis, which is our culture. And we all know that Department of English of Punjabi University is not a just a language of department. This is a, a department of language and cultural studies. You know, the Tagore study cycle was created on behalf of Punjabi University in the English department, and all those rich traditions continue. Then another paragraph I am very tempted to read. She writes, the first convocation on March 5, 1949. In fact, I learned a lot from her writings. The first convocation on March 5, 1949, when the convocation address was delivered by Sardar Vallabhbhai Patel, that ushered in a new era of Punjab University in independent India. The innovative solutions to the problems of continuing the academic programs and conducting examinations and the extraordinary efforts required to make the university resume functioning with normalcy are a reminder to us that such efforts can be made even in the times of great crisis and challenging circumstances. So you can see how well and how lucid she writes. She went on and says, the speed and the energy with which the academy programs were undertaken is evident from the fact that by the retirement of the then Vice Chancellor Devan Anand Kumar in 1957, 19 te teaching departments had been revived, the law and commerce colleges were running, and over 100 colleges were affiliated. The library had acquired over 70,000 books after having been decimated at the time of partition. And the construction of new campus in Chandigarh had begun. And she, in the end, she writes, over the past 60 years, the university has made great strides and has faced these spells of militancy in Punjab and recurring financial difficulties with fortitude. Many conferences of prestigious associations and academic bodies have been held, and eminent thinkers, writers, poets, sociologists, and historians have given lectures here. It is to the credit of dedicated teachers and researchers that funds running into billions of in, into billions in projects have been sanctioned by various funding agencies to strengthen the 61 teaching departments and regional centers and 170 affiliated colleges. So this is an example of us, how well she writes, our speaker for today. So I'm very happy that Pushpindarji accepted our request to deliver today's lecture on Nobel Prizes 2020. So thank you very much again, ma'am. And this is with this I conclude. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much, Mr. Grover. Uh, and uh, I would before I hand over to Mrs. Dharamveer to introduce the speaker, 
uh, though, as Professor Grover said, she is very well known in her field. And I know her personally for more than 30 years, maybe 40 years. And uh, so Mrs. Dharamveer, please introduce the speaker. Thank you, uh, you Samanji. And it is an honor to, for me to introduce Professor Pushpinder Seyal. And I am in total awe. You will see why. Dr. Pushpinder Seyal is the professor of English at Punjab University, Chandigarh. She has also had the important position of advisor and secretary to the vice chancellor, what we call SVC. With over 38 years of experience in teaching, researching and guiding PhD scholars in Punjab University, Professor Pushpinder Seyal is highly respected in the domains of literature and linguistics. She has an MA and PhD in linguistics from Lancaster University and brings to her classroom and writings a wealth of knowledge and critical insights, especially in the fields of pedagogy, critical literacy and stylistics. She graduated from Guru Nanak Dev University Amritsar and did her master's at Punjab University. In both these places, she was the university topper. She got the prestigious Commonwealth Academic Staff Scholarship in 1984, and her many achievements include the Charles Wallace Trust Fellowship and the Australia India Council Fellowship. As chairperson of the Department of English, she initiated courses on language teaching, linguistics, English proficiency, etc., and created a language lab laboratory in the department. She had a brief stint as the director of the Lucknow campus of EFL University. EFL is English and Foreign Languages University. It used to be an institute in Hyderabad when we were students. And I'm glad to learn that it has now flowered into a university with many cam campuses. Pushpinder has taught and organized many academic staff college refresher courses at Punjab University and other universities like Goa, GNDU, Kurukshetra, Himachal Pradesh University, Shimla, Delhi University, JNU, etc., etc., and etc. She has conducted British Council courses on teacher training for business English, staff and personal training for various institutions, including CII, APJ, Chitkara, BBMB, and many others. She's also special faculty for communication at Iser Mohali and College of Social Science, Bhopal. She's on the board of studies of several universities in the neighborhood. She's involved in materials and curriculum design at CBSE, NCR, and EDUSAT programs, very important national programs. She's editor of, she has been editor of Journal of Department of English, Punjab University for several years from 1997. She has mentored, she has mentored a large number of scholars. Hold your breath, large number means 25 PhDs and 30 MPhils in the areas of stylistics, language teaching and new literatures. These are the areas of her research interests. She's on the advisory board of several well-known journals and is a reviewer for several others. She has published over 50 papers and two books. The books are Style and Structure in Commonwealth Literature and Introduction to Linguistics, both from very, very prestigious houses, printing houses. She has translated one novel and one play from Punjabi into English. And 
she writes poetry and fiction too. So today we have one poetess talking about the work of another. Eager to hear you, Professor Sial Pushpinder. Please. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Can everyone yes, hear? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, all right. Um, good afternoon, colleagues and students and all the listeners today um, uh, for this uh, meeting that we have on uh, the Nobel Prize winner, uh, Louise Grick of um, America. Um, uh, I uh, thank you for your wonderful introduction. Uh, and uh, uh, and I thank Professor Grover, uh, you know, for for all these you know all these appreciative uh, words. Um, he has always appreciated, uh, um, you know, uh, whether I whether I deserve it or not. But he's always had confidence in me, and um, also I in, uh, have also been very much uh, appreciative and impressed by. Uh, by his uh, leanings towards uh, so many disciplines and uh, giving the opportunity during his tenure as vice chancellor to uh, uh, to uh, to listen for us to listen to uh, so many great scientists who visited the university and so many authors in, uh, such as uh, and it was wonderful uh, to uh, have these experiences which he initiated and uh, you know the colloquium also which uh, which also gave us the chance to uh, listen to so many uh, great uh, scholars uh, bhatnagar awardees also um, for me it has always been a treat to be part of these programs uh, so uh, i hope i can do justice to uh, what uh, you know uh, to the to the great poet who has won the nobel prize um, today and uh, at the very least, I think perhaps if I could interest some of the students in uh, um, in her poetry and in reading her poetry, because these days um, somehow um, perhaps people might not think poetry as being of much relevance. Um, and of course, uh, the important thing is that a lot of poetry is now available in audio readings, and uh, the poet herself has done a lot of readings of her poems. So it's it's a good thing to be able to, if, even if you don't want to read, uh, you can listen to the poet in her own voice. So I begin the, the lecture by, uh, by talking about the Nobel Prize in general, and also about uh, the, uh, the, the Nobel Literature Prize in particular, uh, because um, um, you know, I, I've always felt that uh, it was a great foresight on the part of the uh, of the Nobel Committee to uh, to initiate the prize in literature because uh, uh, the twentieth century was well understood uh, as being very very important, and there was a revolution going on in all the sciences. But for literature to be included, there must have been some kind of thinking which um, believed that uh, uh, literature is also important and that it will guide and it will uh, help understanding uh, which takes place in other uh, areas uh, that, such as science. Uh, while science uh, works differently, it's, um, it advances human knowledge uh, in terms of progression of uh, um, of uh, the the knowledge, the linear pro progress, but literature is a little different. It circles around. It moves through circles, and it moves through circles again and again on the same concerns, trying to uh, expand our consciousness and deepen our awareness um, on the same concerns: life, love, mor mortality relationships, nature, uh, perception of, of the world, emotion, and filtered through a lot of individual and collective experiences. And these experiences are common to us all. They are so vast and so varied 
that they are inexhaustible. And uh, just as in science, scientists feel that the universe is inexhaustible as an object of study, so are our human experiences. Uh, poetry um, uses language, particularly. It is, it is the use of language in a particular way. It uses language to get a grip on this range, unlimited range of experience. And uh, uh, there isn't a Nobel Prize in philosophy, uh, perhaps because uh, literature itself contains philosophy. And a lot of the writings of Nobel laureates in literature over the years have been philosophical. Um, so these are uh, uh, intertwined with literature, and they all shed some kind of knowledge on other fields, on, on science as well. So um, language becomes something through which literature, the, the experience that uh, literature can convey, and um, uh, the struggle with language, because it's not always easy. It's not always easy to convey some of these very subtle experiences, um, very, very inarticulated, unspoken thoughts and feelings in language. So for anyone, as Grover mentioned Tagore, right from the beginning, you know, of the Nobel, Nobel uh, prizes in literature that we've seen in the writers, they have this concern with how to articulate uh, those experiences which come from their own location, their own background, but they are truly universal. And that is through language. Now, again, language in all the languages of the world, many of the prizes have been by writers who are not necessarily English writers. And, uh, you know, writers in all languages, many languages have won these prizes. Uh, so, uh, and of course, that's been translated. So there's a role of translation also. Um, the struggle with language is common in all languages as, as the struggle to convey experience. And uh, not just um, with language, but there is a struggle with silence also. And uh, the gaps between language and silence. So uh, T.S. Eliot uh, called uh, poetry, um, in quotes, a raid upon the inarticulate. So poetry performs a raid on what is inarticulate, what is unspoken. And um, James Joyce also said that his purpose in, in his uh, the ending of his book, Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, uh, that uh, he his concern as an artist is uh, to uh, recreate in the smithy of his soul the uncreated conscience of his race, the uncreated conscience of his race. So uh, when we uh, speak of um, uh, Louise Group having won the uh, Nobel Prize this year, uh, we see a culmination of uh, poetry um, of the last um, many years uh, in a certain area that is the Anglo-American poets and uh, women Anglo, uh, women American poets. Uh, the Nobel Committee had made a comparison of Louis Glutz with Emily Dickinson. And uh, when I read uh, uh, this poet, I did, did feel uh, a lot of uh, uh, similarity basis for this connection. You see, the American women poets, and uh, uh, of course, we also talk about the black American women poets. Uh, the last one to win the Nobel Prize was uh, the uh, Toni Morrison, the, the writer of, of the person. Uh, the, the, these Anglo-American poets that we are talking about here today are white because in America, we do make a distinction between the peculiar sensibility, the peculiar experiences, reflected by black writers uh, and by white writers. Though, of course, at some point, uh, those come together also. What they have to say comes together for all of us. It's not that uh, they speak only to a certain group or community. So these, uh, these poets uh, are uh, uh, known as having become very reflective and very um, philosophical and uh, uh, in in the case of Louis Cruz, 
uh, very uh, introspective and uh, as well as unromantic in a way. So um, uh, I'd like you to, to understand that uh, even poetry, which isn't really concerned directly with current affairs or with politics, um, you know, and problems, world, world problems directly, can still be relevant. You know, I, I would like you to, like the students to understand this, that, uh, uh, that uh, this basic question that is poetry that doesn't directly concern itself with, uh, you know, current issues or with the problematics of, um, of the world, um, uh, is, is that poetry still, still relevant? And I think that in considering the poetry here by Louise Glutz, we might be able to answer this question. So uh, first of all, I'd like to say something about uh, the themes that she's concerned with. Um, the themes that she concerned, she's concerned with are the themes that concern all poets. Um, childhood, family, mortality, loss, nature, history, mythology. She has many connect collections of poetry and uh, they span this whole range of themes. Um, the concern with childhood was there in a lot of her earlier poetry, but uh, this is not uh, an idealized childhood. Uh, this is a childhood which uh, actually um, looks at uh, the relationships, family relationships, in, in a very deep and uh, perhaps conflicted sense also. So it's uh, not uh, uh, exactly very simple and straightforward, although her language is uh, quite simple. I'll come to that, uh, her use of language. So I just want to quote one line on uh, what, uh, what uh, she says. Quote, we look at the world once. We look at the world once in childhood. We look at the world once in childhood. The rest is memory. So uh, this sense of, um, of uh, looking at the world and uh, looking at the world with different eyes, uh, that is what defines that experience. And uh, then uh, also the slow and uh, uh, increasing understanding of uh, the deeper conflicts or the deeper emotions which are involved in family relationships, uh, that also becomes a concern. And it becomes a kind of um, pathway uh, to uh, understanding who one is. And what I mean about her using simple language uh, is evident in this uh, little poem, uh, which I'll read. Uh, she says, she writes, Long ago, I was wounded. I lived to revenge myself against my father. Not for what he was, for what I was. From the beginning of time in childhood, I thought that pain meant I was not loved. It meant loved. So let's look carefully at this, that I thought that pain meant I was not loved. But the last sentence here says, it meant I loved. So there it is not uh, important whether a person is loved or not. What that pain comes from is the fact of your own capacity to love, your own loving. That's the source. And... Um, this is uh, um, irreflective of the sort of a searing um, pain and the searing emotion that some of these family relationships evoke. She says that she doesn't uh, want to um, use a, you know, a very difficult words or complicated words in her poetry. Um, students will be glad to hear that. Um, but she does emphasize the possibility of context. She says that words can be used in an unlimited range of contexts. And the use of language in poetry is exploring all these different contexts, 
entirely unexpected contexts which go on and which can unfold in a poem. Um, she has been known for being very bleak and uh, um, even people say depressing uh, in, in dealing with her themes and also in the way in which she doesn't uh, embellish her language. She doesn't use a lot of um, romanticization in, in her language. Um, in a way, it's like um, uh, not being afraid of truth, not being afraid of dark uh, things which are revealed uh, in exploration, and just trying to uh, be romantic about feelings or about experiences, um, just uh, bringing them into some other sort of an um, uh, uh, framework or rosy way of looking uh, at things. She's very aware of the perils of romanticism. In fact, uh, um, uh, following the philosopher, following the philosopher Alan Boudou, um, who says the greatest question of contemporary art is how not to be romantic. The greatest question of contemporary art is how not to be romantic, unquote. In fact, there has been a movement against romanticism in modern poetry. And uh, Louise Brooks also says in her uh, in uh, one of her essays, romance is what I most struggle to be free of. That's, that's her own words. Romance is what I most struggle to be free of. So here, you know, we can perhaps the scientists will, <laughs> will kind of uh, appreciate that, that uh, uh, there is no sense of uh, covering over or glossing over certain things which might be uncomfortable. And uh, that could be said very directly without uh, the aura of romanticism around it. And this is uh, what she's known for as a poet. Uh, many young uh, uh, people will perhaps uh, relate to that uh, because uh, romanticism uh, had its day. And after that, in modern literature, romanticism was uh, very much uh, revolted against. I mean, there was, it was resisted. But what is to replace romance? That is something which is more problematic. What will, what will take the place of romance? Um, so what sort of romance? Because we do keep constructing romances, whether we call them romances or not. Uh, so um, one quote that I like very much that she has uh, uh, written about to one of her, uh, uh, she's a great essay, essayist also, prose writer also. And uh, she has written several uh, collections of essays. And one essay which uh, I dipped, in, dipped into uh, and enjoyed quite a bit, understood that what she's talking about is uh, the education of the poet. It's an essay. It's called uh, The Education of the Poet. And in that, she says that poetry is more intimate than any living friend. Poetry can help you to be more intimate than any living friend. And um, there is a collection of poems of hers called The Wild Iris, uh, like this collection. Uh, now, what does she do here? It's very interesting. Um, like the romantics, in a way, that she is against, that she is struggling to be free of, uh, she is concerned with nature. All poets are concerned with nature. Because it is the imagination, it is the perception of the natural world that most um, inspires poets. And yet, what is the relationship of human being with nature? That has always been a point of uh, questioning. Uh, and uh, what she does is that she tries to construct some non-human speakers. And uh, who are these speakers? Uh, you know, romantic poets have often thought that uh, the, that uh, and uh, the romantics like Keats and Shelley and so on did uh, did imagine the wind and the flowers and the birds speaking to us. Uh, they did that in their own way. Uh, what Louise Gluck does is that she uh, she takes up the voices of uh, these these flowers and uh, how they can speak. It's, it's trying to assume 
that nature can speak to us so in a way it is a fantasy it's not perhaps it is true perhaps it is not true perhaps our consciousness itself is so limited that we cannot hear what nature is saying um and what the poet can do is perhaps reconstruct or reimagine what uh, nature might be saying to us what flowers might be saying to us or what uh, gods uh, might be saying to us so um there is a poem in the wild iris called red poppy and um, in that the red poppy is supposed to be speaking the flower is supposed to be speaking and the flower says oh my brothers and sisters were you like me once long ago before you were human now if you if if one can imagine that uh, this is what which has always been there for a long time um is trying to say to us were you like me once long ago before you were human uh this um uh, this kind of mode of uh, representation of nature is a little is a little different from the earlier romantics and uh, then she also tries to establish some forms of address you know poets have always tried to to address someone either uh, the poet is addressed by somebody someone else or the poet is addressing someone else so uh, forms of address are intrinsic to poetry and uh, uh, speaking to god for instance which is what poets have tried to do to imagine some uh, context in which they are speaking to god um i see it is with you as with the birches the birches are the trees you see when we talk to nature when we want to talk to nature we come up against a barrier nature doesn't have our language we don't have nature's language so how do we talk i see it is with you as with the birches i am not to speak to you in the personal way much has happened between us so in in um, uh, the poem um the red poppy um it is uh, a flower taking birth again you see louis clutz is quite a lot concerned with the 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 possibilities of reincarnation not in the way in which um, in india we have some theory of karma reincarnation etc not exactly in that sense but in the sense of uh, uh, the connection of um, of uh, these bodies in nature which take shape again and again you know differently they take shape again and again and uh, they, they take different forms and uh, they might they might get the chance to speak in one of these forms as humans have got the chance to speak in human form so as that maybe it's a flower maybe it's a plant the tree which is taking shape under the earth which is taking form under the earth so she writes overhead noises branches of the pine shifting the weak sun flickered over the dry surface it is terrible to survive as consciousness buried in the dark earth consciousness wishes to come out so that's that's um, how i look at it then it was over that so this is the next part of the poem then it was over that which you fear being a soul and unable to speak so nature seems to fear being unable to speak ending abruptly the stiff earth bent a little and what i took to be birds dance darting in the low shrubs you who do remember passage from the other world i tell you i could speak again so it is the desire of for language the desire to be able to speak and to have a voice of the soul so um reincarnation and birth rebirth uh, these are some of the themes of some of these poems and 
forms of address that I was mentioning with her talking to God or a God speaking to you. So here the God is speaking. And what is the God saying? The God says, all this time I indulged your limitations. He's saying to the human being, all this time I indulged your limitations. Thinking you would cast this aside, uh, cast it aside yourself sooner or later. Thinking matter could not absorb your, absorb your gaze forever. So the God is actually talking and saying that all this time I indulged your limitation, thinking you would cast it aside yourself sooner or later, thinking matter could not absorb your gaze forever. I restricting myself to images. That's what we do. No? We, restrict, we restrict God to images. He says, I cannot go on restricting myself to images because you think it is your right to dispute my meaning. I am prepared now to force clarity upon you. So this is a different kind of voice of God than what we are used to hearing. Uh, it's in a poem called Clear Morning. And uh, clarity, clarity that, uh, that comes uh, with, the, with that thought, with thought. So that, that is something which we find in Louis Gluck, that um, feeling is there, what the romantics were concerned with, feeling, but also thought. And that thought is a very, very, um, you know, rigorous kind of thought. It's not thought which is, which is going to gloss over the problems or it is going to be, uh, you know, airy fairy. It is, it is actually uh, rigor that Louis Gluck brings into her poems. So that is why they may not be everybody's cup of tea. Uh, but um, very satisfying because we know that there is an engagement with the real thing. And uh, um, talking about death, uh, birth, re reincarnation, and um, uh, Louis Gluck uses some of the mythology from nature, uh, uses the myth of Persephone, for instance, in Greek mythology. Uh, she was taught Greek as a as a child, so she's very much steeped in the Greek mythology, and uh, uh, she uh, uh, uses the myth of Persephone, who had half the year under the earth and half the year above. So she finds that this is a metaphor. Met death gives you a metaphor metaphors for living. So Persephone is living almost in death for half the year being dead for half the year um, gives, gives a different dimension to the living. And um, uh, this uh, uh, is a sort of a negation that she tries to achieve. Uh, you see, the poet Keats talked about negative capability. Louis Glucks calls it negative creation. And in the negative creation tree, she tries to escape uh, the eye of the poet, you know, the, the egotistic eye of the poet, which is almost, you know, that there is a disgust with I. You know, who is this I with which uh, the poet is constantly absorbed? I'm saying this, I feel this, uh, I think this, and so on. You know, this is a sort of an obsession with I. And uh, she tries to avoid that obsession to get out of that I. And in a lot of poetry, poems, we find that the eye slips out of the poem and then maybe slips back in again. This kind of process goes on. So uh, in one poem, she says, um, she conveys the disgust with obsession, self-obsession of I. She says, we are waves of sky blue, like a critique of heaven. Why do you treasure your voice when to be one thing is to be next to nothing? Why do you treasure your voice when to be one thing is to be next to nothing? So, uh, so this is the struggle struggles with the language and with silence, with with self, 
and with loss of self and regaining the self. So uh, I'm just trying to give you an overview of um, the concerns and then I will read a couple of poems which I think you might like. One thing, as I mentioned, is that uh, her essays, Education of the Poet, and um, she says in Education of the Poet that um, uh, she is um, going to, uh, she, she says we make a mistake. Uh, the failure to separate poetry, which sounds like honest speech, from honest speech. You know, there's a difference. Poetry may sound like honest speech, but uh, there's a difference between that and speech, honest speech itself. Therefore, she says, poems are not fingerprints. Poems are not fingerprints. This is, this is an important thing. And then she also writes in Education of the Poet, she says, the source of art is experience. The end product is truth. The artist surveying the actual intervenes and manages, lies and deletes, all in service of truth. That's interesting, isn't it? To lie in service of truth. There is unfortunately no test for truth, she says. That is in part why artists suffer. The love of truth is felt as chronic aspiration and chronic unease. If there is no test for truth, there is no possible security. It is relatively easy to say that truth is the aim and heart of poetry, but harder to say how it is recognized or made. We know it first as readers by its result, by the sudden rush of wonder and awe and terror. So this is uh, Louise Groots trying to define the kind of truth uh, nature, uh, the kind of truth poetry uh, tries to uh, tries to talk about. So I will now uh, just um, mention two things. One is Louis Glutz's use of mythology. Young people today are quite fond of reading about mythology, judging from the kinds of bestsellers that are there. And, um, and it seems to uh, inspire people to tell more stories from, the, from mythology. Uh, in, in fact, uh, it is so that mythology offers uh, a lot of possibilities of reconstruction, recreation, etc. And uh, uh, I'm sometimes skeptical of the way mythology is used by some writers. But I want to read to you uh, one uh, poem uh, by, the, uh, uh, by Louise Gluck. It's called Pantley. See how she uses the situation from the uh, from the Iliad and the Odyssey, the in-between situation where the people, the soldiers, have finished with the Trojan War and they have now they now are faced with the prospect of going home. Um, so that is in between Iliad and Odyssey because Odyssey then will be the whole process of returning back from the war. So uh, uh, but she she uh, tells us about this interval that these people, how, how they are now existing after the war is over. So it's a bit of a critique also. Mythology can be critiqued as well, not just, uh, you know, um, uh, praised. So she writes, uh, a story element, so you will like that. The Greeks are sitting on the beach, wondering what to do when war ends. No one wants to go back home back to that bony island. Everyone wants a little more of what is there in Troy. More life on the edge as being packed with surprises. But how to explain this to the ones at home? To whom fighting a war is a plausible excuse for absence. Whereas exploring one's capacity for diversion is not. Well, this can be faced later. These are men of action, ready to leave insight to the women and children. Thinking things over in the hot sun, pleased by a new strength in their forearms, which seem more golden than they did at home. Some begin to miss their families a little, to miss their wives, to want to see if the war has aged them. And a few grow slightly uneasy 
what if war is just a male version of dressing up a game devised to avoid profound spiritual questions ah but it wasn't only the war the world had begun calling them an opera be beginning with the war of chords and ending with the floating aria of the sirens there on the beach discussing the various timetables for get getting home no one believed it would take 10 years to get back to ithaca no one foresaw that decade of insoluble dilemmas oh unanswerable affliction of the human heart how to divide the world's beauty into acceptable and unacceptable loves i'll just repeat this oh unanswerable affliction of the human heart how to divide the world's beauty into acceptable and unacceptable loves on the shores of troy how could the greeks know they were hostages already who once delayed the enthralled how could they know that of their small number some would be held forever by dreams of pleasure some by sleep some by music so uh, we see the we see that how poetry and narrative combine and how storytelling can uh, can uh, be combined with poetry um, leading to certain unexpected realizations and it is the mythology or the sto earlier story which provides a context for that so uh, i will be um, uh, concluding by the by just mentioning um the relationship between science and poetry uh, again uh, if you see the cover of louise gluck's book uh, selected poems you see the picture of saturn over there with its rings you know forever being a mystery to the world saturn with its rings and this is these are her this is the cover of her book and um, uh, how the poet can give us a very precise description uh, scientists pride themselves on giving very accurate and precise readings of the, and the poet gives no less a precise and accurate reading of how we feel when we encounter the world or what we think when we encounter the world so here is the poem telescope as a, a, a tribute uh, to louis gluck her poem telescope and this is about uh, uh, the astronomy it's about looking through a telescope she says there is a moment after you move your eye away when you forget where you are it seems somewhere else in the silence of the night sky you've stopped being here in the world you are in a different place a place where human life has no meaning you're not a creature in body you exist as the stars exist participating in their stillness their immensity then you're in the world again at night on the cold hill taking the telescope apart you realize afterward not that the image is false but that the relation is false you see again how far away everything is from every other thing i'll just repeat this you realize afterward not that the image is false but the relation is false you see again how far away everything is from every other thing so thank you very much i i would uh, i would like to stop here though there there is uh, there are a lot of things that uh, emerge from the poetry but Uh, i just wanted to give you a glimpse of uh, how she writes and what she writes about and uh, uh, what are the things i like about it so um uh, thank you very much for being patient listeners everyone <laughs> so thank you very much prashinder ji i had sent the link to many of my old friends several of them have joined 
and okay. they have sent their appreciation to you even from tfr and kanpur oh good good thank you thank you so any questions and uh, part, uh, from listeners questions mrs dharavi yeah i don't see uh, i can see lots of appreciative comments okay uh, but anuj can you see if there are any significant comments or questions in the facebook uh, no stream no ma'am sorry uh, there are no questions you can yes, unmute sir. all let them ask directly uh, yes <laughs> well one question one comment or question that you may think uh, most of the modern poets or uh, story writers novelists don't figure in our textbooks what is the reason for that mm. yeah yes can i answer yes sure can you hear me yes sure yes, yeah I, i think there is a big gap between uh, uh, the writers um because writers are very prolific they keep on writing as we can see um, louis gluck has been write, writing for 50 years and uh, whereas the syllabus makers um can't really keep up with the developments uh, that take place also sir i would say that there are certain agendas when we make uh, our syllabus when we uh, put in some some writings in our courses of instruction you know uh, the agendas are either that one person or another person doesn't like uh, certain authors or that they are considered irrelevant because uh, they don't directly deal with certain subjects or that some of them are too uncomfortable for uh, young students to uh, you know understand or to relate to and they might cause some sort of stress it's just the imagination that causes the stress young people are pretty much i feel capable of uh, uh, understanding a lot of uh, uh, stuff that is written but the syllabus makers seem to think that there should be some sort of uh, an agenda and in india we have um, a lot of uh, morality you know and sort of ideologies of certain co- uh, kinds you know that are at work in our uh, formation of or in our choice of writers you know so uh, certain writers who been considered to be great for a long time are uh, uh, unmute unmute shpindaji is muted uh please unmute yes ma'am uh, yeah so can we have a rationale for including shakespeare if we have a rationale then we should include but many times the choices are, that are made are quite arbitrary they just belong to certain uh, certain sects of people who seem to think that uh, um their um, uh, favorite writers or the writers who uh, they think are important for example today in indian writing we are not teaching that much of tagore yeah. we are not teaching that much of arubindo or some of these uh, uh, indian writers but we are teaching of course some of uh, the very very modern ones so sometimes people who prescribe go uh, have a default in towards the more old or the older texts the more ancient texts and then the uh, pendulum swings towards the the modern and the most modern that let's have the most modern writers forget about the old one so these kinds of things lead to a lot of variation in um, uh, in the syllabi and in the texts which are chosen for writing ideally people should be able to uh, be free in uh, choice of texts you know uh, it, that they want to study hmm. any more questions kya ji yes professor dua wants to ask something i Can think you... 
Hey, I did see Professor Dua there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hello, good afternoon, Professor Pashinder. How are you? I'm fine, sir. I'm scared of you. What kind of question <laughs> you're going to ask? <laughs> okay. It was okay. It was wonderful to hear the poetry. But when I was hearing, I, for, the, for the first time I heard about Lucy, Lucy poem, it reminded me a yeah. lot about Rumi. It reminded me a lot about mm. Rumi and Khalil Gibran. Do you think that mm. uh, all these Rumi's poetry mm. and all the things, they also, mm. you know, rule their writing power when uh, these great <laughs> laureates write? After all, she is the laureate poet of the United States yeah. of America. Does yeah. this also come in? Yeah, yeah. I have, uh, yeah, yeah, I have uh, um, read what she has said about autobiographically about her, uh, uh, about her early education and the writers who influenced her. Um, she doesn't seem to be much influenced by uh, the East so much, okay. you know, in, in clear terms, in terms of what she has read, because she has read a lot of the Greeks and uh, a lot of the, uh, the European poets. Uh, but uh, you see, somehow, uh, even in those Greeks and European poets, there was a confluence between the West and the East. There was, a, after all, when we talk about Rumi, uh, we, and even Khalil Gibran, we see that they are right there in the cusp of East and West. You know, yeah. Turkey, Iran, you know, places which are the meeting point or the confluence of Eastern and Western streams of thought, you know, and how uh, those uh, streams have merged over a period of time. So, uh, you know, uh, we might explore that and make comparisons, certainly, because there is a mystic strain in her poetry. Yeah, yeah. There, there is a mystic strain, yes. And, uh, and indirectly, it could be uh, it could be linked uh, to uh, Rumi and uh, Khalil Gibran. You see, these relationships are uh, are indirect. They are subtle relationships. They are subtle connections. Uh, they are I, the connections of the really demarcate. Yeah. Especially when I read her poem that I'm standing on the on the green pasture, and somebody said, yeah. that your father's grave." I immediately get to the side. Yes. And that is my mother's grave. Yes. And that all those things. Yes. You know, echoes Rumi's fusion. Yes. That's what I mean. Oh, that's a wonderful poem. Yes, yeah. indeed. Yeah. And uh, that, uh, yeah, this, this, uh, this, you know, uh, concern with how we face death and how we face and how we relate to our ancestors and how we relate to the earth. You know, mm -hmm. these are these are questions that are intertwined, and uh, we don't um, find exact answers for them. But uh, uh, we, when we try to capture some metaphor, you know, yeah. like the father's grave, yeah. you know, it becomes it's it's a metaphor we are trying to uh, we are trying to explore to bring out what lies in that metaphor. What are what are the meanings that lie behind that metaphor? You know. So that is how you know these poems become exploration, and uh, definitely that's 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 a great observation about the connection, um, you know, maybe unknown connection, but a connection between uh, uh, these mystical poets and poets of love, like Rumi, and how Louise Group looks at love. Uh, again, this is a very uh, unromanticized, very clear, uh, and yet. Uh, uh, very plain and authentic uh, relating uh, because it's not tr trying to cover over uh, the uh, the problem but then how do you uh, how do you talk about it you have to use metaphors metaphors can be a replacement for silence but you can't remain silent so you have to use metaphor you have to use some image or some way of through language okay. that uh, that becomes a challenge yeah can we call it as Sufism? Yeah, I suppose so. 
I mean, we need not we need not categorize, sir. That is one thing, you know, that uh, we we need not categorize because uh, um, you know poetry is trying to. She says that she tries to resist romanticism, so perhaps that implies to implies all isms, all isms that uh, you know mm. that you cannot fit the poetry into that ism any ism at all, uh, and it becomes a very individual voice also. Connection is there with all these other poets of the past and present, but it's a very individual voice also. It is stating something when a poet speaks. That poet speaks something as an individual which no other poet has yeah. spoken. Yeah. Although, although those connections are there, but the individuality is also there. You know. That's that's very good. fine. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? Not uh, thank you, Bishpinder ji. So now I would uh, invite Vivek Atre ji for concluding remarks. Vivek ji, please for your concluding remarks. Thank you very much, ma'am, and thank you SPCSTI for inviting me to speak. I was privileged to listen to your talk, Dr. Sial, uh, not completely, entirely, but uh, quite a lot of it. I must say you. that your understanding of the great poet and writer is absolutely. Uh, wonderful and fabulous because uh, I feel that like a painting uh, is best interpreted by the artist, but is left to others to enjoy in their own way. And uh, I totally agree with you that we cannot really categorize the writings of a great thinker and writer and poet into any one category. And of course, Professor Dua is right in his own way, being a top scientist, uh, he wants to categorize it. But uh, the, the commonality between science and literature has also been brought out today because we are discussing literature at a scientific forum. However, what you said, I totally resonate with that the writer is not wanting to uh, delve into romanticism or any otherism and is actually banking perhaps on the metaphysical and, and the spiritual realms even. I have seen people who are writing and they hold back in mentioning uh, spirituality or religion or God or the almighty, but they mean the same. And we have read that in so many great poets, when they're describing nature, they mean the almighty, they mean, they mean the truth, they mean, they mean the ultimate. And I think uh, the great writings and the great understandings would come only in that aboveness, that raised consciousness is present in the reader as well. So what I am trying to say is that the writer had obviously raised her consciousness while writing something like so beautiful, and her body of work, her volume of work obviously came from that. Uh, and the reader also has to switch to a higher level to appreciate, enjoy, and savor, and understand that particular uh, volume of writing. So I, I totally uh, agree, and uh, it's not my place to say too many words because I'm not a poet. So I'm an author. My fourth book should be out shortly, but uh, nothing uh, of the sort that Dr. Gluck uh, brings out or uh, the sort that Dr. Sial has uh, interpreted for us so beautifully. I would like to say that uh, I, I feel that a lot of young people need to be inspired by Nobel laureates even today. She is 77 years old, as I saw, uh, Professor Louise uh, Gluck. Uh, she is 77. Joe Biden is 77, by the way. <laughs> and uh, Joe Biden being 77 and uh, Trump is a little younger. My mother-in-law is 77 also, by the way. So <laughs> my, my feeling is that people of that age and genre have reached a certain way of thinking which gives them that perspective. But the young authors, the young thinkers, the young writers, if they can be weaned away from Twitter and Instagram for a while and made to think and listen and understand and appreciate, then we can get greater volumes and quality of literature coming through in the coming years, in the coming decades from youngsters. 
and why shouldn't anyone write as beautifully well in their 30s or 40s as uh, Dr. Gluck is, has been writing, obviously for 40 years or something, as you said. But uh, everybody can't do it and everybody is not meant to do it. Those who are talented enough should be encouraged, should be brought to the fore, should attend lectures like this. And I'm very glad that uh, it's being organized. We have a Chandigarh Literary Society, which has a literary festival over the weekend, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday this time. That is November 20 to 22. And I shall share with uh, Dr. Dharamveer, ma'am, Dr. K. Dharamveer, the uh, program, which she would uh, kindly share with all the members of SPSTI. Uh, very good authors and thinkers coming there as well. And uh, it would be a pleasure to associate and try and draw the youngsters to reading, writing, literature, art, photography, my favorite subject of speaking. That why can't people get away from the gram that they live in, which is not Guru Gram, but it is Instagram. Instagram. They live there. <laughs> they live there, they reside there, they have their Aadhaar card in Instagram also because they spend almost 12 hours on it. And uh, so, so can we wean them away or can they start writing poetry on Instagram, which is fabulous and uh, to savor. So we need to find a match and uh, try and involve more people. But very inspiring, Dr. Seal, and very inspiring, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Dharmveer, uh, sir and ma'am, for inviting me. Thank you. Dr. Suman Beri is also a very close associate uh, who is also part of a spiritual organization that I am part of. Professor Dua is an old friend, if I can call him that, a young old friend. And uh, the rest, uh, Dr. Rajni Balla also, I know her very well, so, and others also. My appreciation. And I just saw Professor Arun Grover. Yes, sir, good to see you. And uh, we should be in touch also on such things. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Vivekji. And I, I hope all of us know Vivekji himself is a author and it's good to know that he has started fourth book. We are waiting for it, Vivekji. So it's always a pleasure to read your books also. Thank you very much. Now, now I would invite Dharamvirji for the formal vote of thanks, Dharamvirji. Well, I'm grateful to Pushpandaji for such a lucid uh, exposition on the Nobel Prize in literature this year. And uh, to be very frank, I used to love short stories and uh, short poems by, in Hindi. And my favorite was Prem Chand. I always, whenever I get time, I still go and revisit that poem, that uh, story writer, Prem Chand. But uh, the way you explained the literature of the Nobel Laureate is, was excellent. And for a person like me, it was a very, very good uh, exposition. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sir. And we hope Thank to see you again some on some other uh, in some other program. We keep holding such uh, events from time to time, and we would love to have you because you. the way you explained was very, very lucid and very good. Ma'am, join for and the Economics also, Nobel Prize talk. Talk. And I also yes, I thank. Yeah. Yes. I also thank every yeah. participant, all the distinguished uh, members of the society, distinguished academics. And I also like to thank our team, uh, Anuj Goed, and Mahipal Sharma, uh, who took you, pains sir. in putting the whole program in the correct perspective and using and uh, flawless uh, streaming of the lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you. you, Jaramir. And uh, Pushpinderji, your classmates or school classmates have also attended this lecture. Yes. No one just <laughs> <laughs> your students, of course, were there, but one your class yeah. classmate is also there. So thank okay. you very much. Very nice, very nice. Thank you very much. Thank you for your invitation. Uh, our audience may uh, check our up, uh, upcoming lectures displayed on the screen now. Our next upcoming lecture is on uh, Sri Nivas uh, Ramanujan on 20th of November. And uh, then 21st, we have another lecture on Nobel Prize in Economics on 21st November. Jeez, can't, why? 
Yes, we have two lectures on 21st. Two on 20th. Two on 20th, yes. Odd timing is because of the person from US. Okay. Very distinguished professor. All the three speakers in maths are very, very distinguished. So is our economics speaker. Yes. So you picked up the best people. Yes. And uh, also in physics. Yes. Professor Grover's specialty also. And. Okay, Gary. Okay, Dr. Grover's specialty has speakers pick up. <laughs> no, he picks up. He's expert. Very good speakers. <laughs> and this lecture should also be very interesting. Noel plays in. So you can visit our website www.spstay.org for uh, regular updates and you can also write to us at info at the rate spstay.org or spstay.info at gmail.com. These are our email IDs. And we have all... a sky watch on the night of the 20th. Uh, but the timing will be put up by Anuj on the website. It is mainly for children conducted by Professor Bagla, but all of us can join, whoever. It should interest all of us. Anuj? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, it, it will be shared on our website. So, so uh, <laughs> shall we close the session now, ma'am? Yes, OK. Thank so you. thanks, everyone. Very good to see you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.